It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money Show, the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger, CBS News business analyst and certified financial planner. And this is a program that is built on you. You are the drivers. You go to our website, jillonmoney.com. You click the contact us button. You write down a note and tell us what's going on in your financial life. And we then can help you navigate whatever lies in front of you. Now, the we is me. And the other person in this program is Mark Talercio. He is also a certified financial planner. He's the executive producer. And before we start the program for real, I just want to thank all of you because the Jill on Money Show was just awarded an awesome honor. We have been notified by the All Women in Media Foundation, AWMF, that we have won a Gracie Award for the best nationally syndicated talk show. How about that? Hey, thanks, gang. That's all because of you. We so appreciate that. Okay, now let's get to the matter at hand. We are going to talk to Leah from New York City. Hello, Leah. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me again. It's so much fun. So uh, how have you been for the last few years since we spoke to you last? Um, I've been good. We've had a lot of changes, which is part of why I'm calling. So when you first came to us, what was the motivating factor? Um, We were at the time thinking about how we should be allocating our savings um, in terms of whether or not we would be able to buy an apartment in Manhattan long term. Okay. And were you able to buy an apartment in Manhattan? Absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. A happy renter, I hope. Um, Yeah. No, we love our apartment. This is part of why we're calling is we're hoping, we're expecting our second child. So we're hoping to be able to move to a larger unit in our building. But that's that's going to complicate things in terms of rent. But we really, really love our building. So we're hoping to stay. Well, so congratulations, expecting second child. How old is the first one? Um, She turned three last month. Oh, very nice. So what's going on for you guys? Are you both working full time? Is one home more? What's what's the uh, the split of labor? So we're both working full time. Mm -hmm. um, And I, for the first time this year in my entire adult life, have only one job, which is very exciting. Oh, my gosh. Is that does that Um, feel good or does that feel scary? Oh, it feels so good. Oh, it's, good. It's so good. Now, I got out of academia, and it feels so good not to be pulled in a million different directions. Oh, well, that's great. So how yeah. much do you earn? Um, I earn 80000 Okay. And you have a husband who is earning about how much? So this is where it gets complicated. So his salary from his main job is one hundred thirty. Who's a, Who's that? Is that Mark with a siren or you with a siren? No, that's me. Okay. That's is it coming siren. down or uptown or downtown? I might get it in about 20 minutes. Um, um, okay. It's going down. Okay. Um, okay. So he is 130000 from his main gig. Correct. Okay. Then what else? So I, I have a, like a class that I teach once a week that brings me about another 9000 a year. Mm-hmm. And that's stable. Um, and he has... Um, I don't know if I can, I guess I can call it a side hustle. It's not exactly what it is, where the income is extremely variable. So some months it's zero and some months it's 30,000. Well, let's, can we talk about like the last couple of years, what it's averaged? So basically it went away during COVID Mm -hmm. and then it's come roaring back of late Uh um, related to his field. So, um, but it's it's difficult to know if, if that's going to continue to be the case. So, you know, we mostly we mostly make our budget without taking that money into account. And we've been fine doing okay. that. OK, so you, um, on your 80, let's call your let's say 90. And because you've got your little uh, your your extra 9000. So let's say you're 90, his 130. You're living OK on that. Yeah, we're totally fine. We're still able to save some every month. OK. Um, yeah. OK. And did you guys. um when you were looking at uh, the second child and the first child, like, do you guys make uh, education a priority for the kids? Is that is there a five twenty nine account? What's going on with that? Yeah, so our daughter has fifty thousand in her five twenty nine. Oh, that's great! Amazing. Um, yeah, right. we've put in 
um, we put in 10,000 a year before she was born because she was born in early 2021. Mm -hmm. So we opened an account in my name in 2020. And then we've put in 10,000 each year since then. And then it's made about 10,000 also from the market. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So what about your own savings? Um, what have you guys saved for retirement and non-retirement? So because this is my first year with a full-time job, this is also my first year with um, access to a retirement account. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting 10% into a 403B um, and then I get a 4% match. Great. And my husband is putting 10% into a Roth 401k. And he, I think, gets matched 50% up to the first 5%, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And um, how much money do you guys have in retirement savings? So between that and then both of us do a backdoor Roth every year mm -hmm. um, and we max that out. Mm -hmm. So because we just crossed the, the income threshold. Um, so I have, I think, in total about 130 Okay. between the Roth IRA and the 403B, and he has probably about the same. I'm not sure exactly what his balances are, but about the same. Okay, that sounds good. And uh, how old are you guys now? Um, I'm 39, and my husband is 35. That was very smart of you. Yeah, very I told him smart. I have to die first. That's the plan. Yeah, well, okay, well, I'm sure he's signed on to whatever <laughs> you decide. What's your rent right now, Leah? Um, we pay just under 4000 so what do you think it's going to like, are you, um, do you think it's going to like, by how much do you think we are talking about the, the rental increase for you? So it's a great question. So our building is rent stabilized, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but they can, there, there's tends to be a, a significant increase when you move in and then it stays relatively flat. So, okay. um, we, we definitely want a second bathroom and we're hoping to get a third bedroom as well, or like a flex room that could be used that way. Yep. Um, so I think that'll probably cost us closer to six. So it's a significant increase. So, but right now, when you say like, okay, out of academia, nice income, he's got his main gig, you've got this little extra class income. If you look at your cash flow now, putting all the money you're putting away in retirement, is there anything else you're putting money into besides the raw, um, besides the 529 plan? Um, yeah, we we're putting um, at least a thousand a month into a brokerage. Okay, how much is and in we the have. Um, well, between the brokerage that we started together and then the ones each of us brought into marriage, we mm -hmm. actually have, I think, about 300000 Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So you do 1000 a month into the brokerage and then ten grand a year into the 529, right? Yeah. And it's what we've, what we've sort of done is, so we have, we have a lot of just liquid cash right now. Mm -hmm. um, and when, particularly when the money from my husband's side gig comes in, we sometimes just do a big dump into the market Okay, I got um, or into the 529. So that tends to be how we fund, fund the 529. It's just once a year, if we take one of those. But those I mean, obviously, if you in. just, if you, if you get the new rental in uh, the income, too bad it's the other way, if you have the new rental <laughs> expense, of, you know, the 25 grand extra, $24,000 extra, you should be able to do it because all you have to do is basically start by pretty much saying no more putting money into the brokerage until we absorb this, right? Right. Okay. We'll get back to Leah in just a moment. If you've got a financial question, go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show, and we are here trying to help you make better, not the best, but better financial decisions, or we're trying to help you weigh what options you have. If you've got something going on in your life, a big change or a small one, or maybe something's kind of keeping you up at night, perhaps it's a conversation that you're nervous about having with your adult parents. Maybe it's a way to create an off-ramp to your next career. Whatever is going on, we'd love to hear from you. All you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. 
Now, while you're on the website, there's so much great stuff there. And I just want to point it out to you because we have a free weekly newsletter that Mark puts together every Friday. It's almost like the perfect warm up to get in the mood for the weekend show. We also have this cool service. It's called Jill on Money Live. It's a subscription service. And for $35, that grants you access to quarterly live webinars. We just had one with productivity expert Cal Newport. It was great. I learned a lot. We also put up special video content behind that paywall. And again, it's not really even like a paywall. It's sort of like a low dog fence that you have to just sort of step over for 35 bucks. If you sign up right now, $35 access to those quarterly live webinars that are coming up and also go watch all the old stuff that lives behind that paywall. It's all there for you. Okay, right now, let's get back to Leah from New York City and figure out how she's going to upgrade to a bigger rental. How much money is in liquid cash right now? Um, a little over 100000 Okay. So, I mean, you would tap that to do whatever you need to do because moving is always expensive and, right? right? Like just you need new stuff. Right. And nothing, you know, the move is not imminent. Nothing's open in the building, but mm -hmm. they know, like the super and the handyman know that we're expecting another and we do eventually want more space. So yeah, it's unclear like, what the timeline is. So what I think is really awesome is that, you know, you are in great shape. You have much more stable income. I, I guess that the best way to approach this, at least when you have like a new big expense, is pull back on this thousand dollars a month and just you'll absorb it. It'll be fine. And then what I would do is the money that comes in from the variable income that your husband earns can basically be used to fund 529 and or brokerage doesn't okay. I mean I don't think that you should make yourself crazy you're both you're young we have young kids you already have 50 grand that's put into the 529 account I think that it would be um, it would behoove you to take a little of the pressure off yourselves I mean you have you're putting money into the brokerage which is kind of like the self-imposed discipline it's great but let's see how you absorb the new rent and and until right. then you can keep doing it no problem is there any other big expense or big potential income change that we should think about before we kind of sign off on this plan uh, well there are two things so the first is um that our daycare is going to go up next year because we're going to have a second kid starting in january in daycare mm -hmm. um and the other is that our our daughter um has autism spectrum disorder Mm -hmm. So right now, one of the amazing things about New York is all of her services are provided by the city. It's amazing. We're not paying anything. She goes to school in the mornings. It costs us nothing. Her, she has nine therapists, therapies a week. We pay nothing. It's incredible. Wow. Um, and that'll be true for two more years. Um, but once she starts kindergarten, it becomes a little bit more complicated in terms of how are we, you know, we, the most important thing to us is that all of her needs are met. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible that we'll end up having to pay for some of that. So that's, you know, two years away. It's a long time. Um, and we might not have to do any of that, but just, you know, assumptions we had made about the sort of schooling that we would want for her mm -hmm. have turned out to be more complicated than what we imagined when we had her, as is often the case in life. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, I, I you, know, you make your plan and then whatever happens, it happens. So in that case, given those two issues, the daycare and um, the potential change in the cost, then I absolutely think that building up your brokerage account is important and it would take priority to me over the 529 by the way because okay. are you saying that uh, do you think that given that um her diagnosis that she will use the money in the 529 in some way shape or form or do you think that's off the table so we yeah so we don't i mean i'm learning a lot about the lingo of the autism community and they no longer use the language of high functioning um mm -hmm. But she, you know, she's really thriving with her therapies and her teachers seem to think that like mainstream school is an option for her. I mean, I'm not worried that she's not going to be able to live independently, have a job okay. long term, all of okay. those things. And I, I think my under, I mean, it's hard to know because she's only three, but I, I, we're not at a point right now where we imagine that she won't be able to go to college. Okay. Um, I mean, that's fine. That's great. And so yeah. I think that what you guys need to do is when that variable income pops into your husband's lap like uh i mean i i don't know what was it last year or what is it what is it has what do you expect this year like what's on the books for him this year so this year it's we're already at about 50 
Holy smokes. Okay. Yeah. So um, in that respect. And then it's going to slow down in the summer and then it might pick up again in the fall. It's a little okay. bit hard to know. So I think that like when you have that lump sum, then you sort of take a deep breath and you make a decision about like, I may, I, what I might do is say, okay, if I had 50 grand extra, you know, you're going to put some money into cash because there's going to be taxation around that. Right. Right. And then I think that I would probably try to prioritize my brokerage. Like, so you might say I'll put 10 grand in the second child's account for this year and nothing in the, in the first child's account, unless you've done it already. And then every, not. and everything else goes into brokerage and see okay. how the rest of the year goes. Because things are going to change pretty dramatically in terms of cash flow. And I think you're going to want a higher amount uh, in accessible brokerage and cash. I really do. Right. And so I would pull back on the $1,000 a month. I would just actually just give yourself a little bit of a breathing room. When's the baby due? Um, June. Okay. So this is happening in like tomorrow, basically. So um, I no wish I wish it were. I'm ready okay. for the pregnancy to be oh, over. But okay. my doctor okay. says I should not wish for the baby to come down. No, so. no. We want that baby to just hang out, gestate, relax, exactly. come, come when they need to come. So um, look, last couple of questions. Um, do you guys both have life insurance? Yes. We have $2 million on my husband and one point five on me. And it's 30-year term. Great. And um, do you guys have estate documents? We do. Great. First of all, you're in great shape. I think that overall, I think the next couple of years, just you're going to know a lot more information. Eventually, what I believe is going to happen for you guys is that you'll you'll have more information about your first child, about like what's going to happen in terms of cost. You'll have higher costs for daycare, but you'll be making more money. It will happen. And I think ideally, I'd love to get you guys um, – you know, sort of stable in the next couple of years. And then we're going to start slowly, but surely you'll just call us back, start increasing your retirement contributions. I think okay. that will happen, but I don't want to do that now today. Okay. You are where you are and we've got to prepare for these two big, in, you know, changes in terms of your, your cash flow. And I think, okay. you know, and I mean, look, I I'm happy with you continuing to do a backdoor Roth in addition to your 10% to your retirement accounts. I really am. I just think that um, don't go crazy with like the four savings right now. You're saving a bunch of money and we have to pay for this stuff that's coming up. Oh, so I've been prioritizing the Roth because my um, at work, I only have a, a post tax, a pre-tax option. OK, um, so I feel like we'd rather be putting money into the Roth since my husband has the Roth 401k at work. That's good to know for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, my husband keeps saying we're fine. Why are you worrying like we have more money this year than we did a year ago. And I know that's all true. I'm just like a warrior and planner by nature. What else can we do for you, Leah? Um, I think that's everything. Thank You're the you best. very much. I'm so Thank happy. You. I want you to get that, um, get that rent stabilized apartment. We're excited for you. Yeah. I hope it works out. Hey, you guys, you could be renters also. Look at all this cash flow. How they would be able to buy a three bedroom in New York City and be paying $6,000 a month, it would, just wouldn't happen. So there are places in this country where renting is a better deal than purchasing. If you are looking at renting versus buying and you've got kids that are coming and big expenses and you need some help prioritizing, give us a holler. Go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's the Jill on Money show. And let's go next to Lee, who's on the line from the Bay Area. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a new listener. I love your program. I just found you about a month ago. Um, I've been thinking my retirement strategy and wondering, am I contributing too much to my 401k and should I redirect that into my brokerage account? 
Mm, I love this question. We've gotten a bunch of people who have had this exact same issue. So I'm so happy you contacted us. So Lee, how old are you? 61. And you're still working full time, right? Yes. And I love my job and I, and I plan to work until I'm 65. Great. How much do you earn? Um, I earn about 200000 Okay, great. Are you married, partnered, single, any of the above? I'm single. And do you have children? Yes, two adult children fully launched. Okay, that's such good news. I love that. I love I love fully launched. Those are that's like music to my ears. So, my next question for you is of your $200,000, how much are you putting into retirement right now? Well, I just ran some numbers. It's close to about um, six grand a month. I do the I do my four hundred one k. I do a catch up, and my employer lets me do after tax. So I do the um, mega backdoor Roth. Wow, that's a ton of money. So how much money is in the retirement account right now, total? So my total in my retirement accounts is two point four million. Whoa, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And so break it down for me. Which it, 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 is any part of that Roth? Yes, I have um, 345000 in Roth, mm-hmm. um, 400000 in my 401k, and the remaining in traditional IRAs. Okay, that's great. So um, that's the mega backdoor, of course. Okay, so... What about your non-retirement savings? How have you managed that? Tell me what you have so far. I have um, 1.1 in a brokerage account. I have another 200K in emergency. And then just another, like in in my checking, perhaps 10K. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. You um, own or do you rent in the uh, Bay Area? Own. Okay, what is the house worth? Oh, about 950. Wow, is there a mortgage that still remains on it? No. Oh my gosh, live in large. And you love this house, you're going to keep this. This is like your forever or is there some no, other No, it's not my forever. I'd like to probably downsize at some point. And would you stay in California or would you downsize to a cheaper state? I would stay in California. Okay. So when you look at your, I mean, you're saving so much money, but what would you guess your expenses are? Oh, um, my expenses are very minimal. Maybe, I don't know, 5000 a month. Oh, my gosh. You, there's, you said you're going to work till you're 65. What does yes. your Social Security benefit look like at your full retirement age or at age 70? Do you know that? I, I, it's a lot. I looked at it. I, I don't, I have that somewhere, but... I don't have it handy. I want to say it's like four grand, I think. Yeah. I mean, like there's no, there's literally no problem in your life right now in terms of your money. So if you're asking me, you know, are you saving too much in retirement? I think the bigger issue is that because so much of your money has not yet been taxed between the traditional 401k and the IRA, there's probably going to be an opportunity for you to try to get some of that money out or convert some of that money when you stop working. It doesn't have to be right this second, but I kind of am, I I get what you're saying, which is, you know, your top bracket right now, I know you pay a lot of taxes because you're a single filer in a high tax state, California. Right. So that means, you know, your, your top bracket is 32%, but California taxes a lot, but you still have a lot of money. So I think that if you're willing to kind of suck it up a little bit and just say, you know what, I'm going to pull back on my retirement contribution and build up the brokerage account, mostly because you have so much money that hasn't been taxed, it's creating a problem. And the more you put in there, the bigger the problem gets. So right now, with all this money you're putting away, I could certainly see a an easy fix to the compounding problem, which is like, don't put as much in and and certainly don't put any money in pre-tax and just direct that to your brokerage account. But if we were going to wind the clock forward to say you're age 65, and if you love your job, you can keep working till you're 70, whatever you want to do. But let's just pretend that it's 65. What, what you would then do at age 65 would be to look at the money that is pre-tax 
and you would start withdrawing some of that money every year until age 70. I mean, it literally would go into a sort of a hundred grand a year kind of cadence here where you'd say, let me take a hundred thousand out. Let me pay the tax that's due and live on because you probably don't even need that much. You could probably pull out. uh, mm, Yeah, I mean, I would even say you could probably pull out like one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for those five years, assuming tax rates stay at these levels. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's just say that you, if you could pull money out at the 24% tax bracket, right? You pull the money out for those five years and you'll start to alleviate that future burden of your required minimum distribution. Then when you claim social security at age 70, what you would do is you would pull out less money every year from 70 to 75. All right. But you would still pull money out for those years. I'm not sure it's going to make sense to necessarily convert it. I think you can get a lot of money out during those years. But you could also, if you have enough money in your brokerage account, potentially be able to convert the money. But let's see, because it may just be easier to pull it out, pay the tax, move on. You have no money problems. We're talking about an efficiency problem. We'll get back to Lee in just a minute. If you've got a financial question, just give us a holler. Go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button and let us know if you would be willing to come on the air live because that's a lot of fun. Now, if you don't want to come on the air live, that's okay too. We like to read your emails. We want to make sure we capture all the people out there who've got questions. If you are going to just write an email, though, please give us lots of information so we can better answer the question that is in front of us. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make different financial choices, or at least have you articulate what you'd like to do. And then Mark and I, who are both certified financial planners, will try to figure out the best options for you. Okay, let's get back to Lee, who's on the line from the Bay Area. Did she mention the the rental units? No, I didn't hear about a rental unit. I didn't hear that at all. Oh, yeah. (laughs) What kind of rental units? Tell me. I have rental properties um, that um, produce that are owned free and clear and that produce, um, an income. Oh boy. Um, I think about 60 K. This is ruining my game plan. There goes my tax bracket issue. Well, I'll tell you what, are you going to keep these rental properties? Yes, definitely. And if I move from my primary residence, I would convert this to another rental property. You would. Okay. Well, I mean, you don't need the money. So what's the difference? You're just collecting money. You're like Leona Helmsley. And then I'm also, I I heard on one of your shows recently, I'm 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 afraid to spend. (laughs) I've accumulated. I got to work on decumulating. Let me ask you something. Are you charitably inclined at all? Yes. Okay. And another thing to consider that may be worth your, just because you are charitably inclined, is that when you turn 70 and a half, what you could do is start um, using your pre-tax retirement accounts as a way to give money. So a qualified charitable distribution can come from a retirement account. You know, when, I, I presume when you retire, it'll get rolled over into a traditional IRA. You can pull money out of that IRA account and direct it. You and and you know, it doesn't come to you. You actually just say, "I want to direct this to charities up to a hundred thousand dollars a year," and that could be another way to get money out of those accounts, which might be very helpful to you. You know, if you are, and it only works if people like charities, right? Like, if, so if you're charitably inclined, you've got your adult kids and they're fully launched, and you want to like do something nice, that's a wonderful way to get money out of those accounts. But otherwise, I mean, the rental properties, 
the equity in the house, all the money in the world that you've saved, you are in fantastic shape. Absolutely fantastic shape. Is there any reason why either of your kids would want to purchase your house from you? Oh, that's funny. I did ask it because my son is getting married and they want to buy a house. And even though they're both high tech workers, um, it's almost impossible to buy a house here in mm. the Bay Area um, with within their budget. They mm. they don't want to be house poor, poor. But would you could you know one idea might be that if like they want to buy the house, you could hold the mortgage on the paper on the house, and it doesn't have to be a seven percent note. In other words, they could pay you. You could say, all right, um, I own the house. I'm selling it to you. Right. So they buy the house for nine and, they, and all they would have to do is come up with a down payment, which they may, you know, if they're high tech workers, maybe they can do it. This is something you should actually think about. This could be a great idea, in which case you can say to them, well, you know, I will extend the mortgage to you. You'll pay me based on, I don't know, three percent, three and a half percent, something that's reasonable for you that gets them into the house. And you can have an attorney draft this so that your other kid doesn't feel like, oh, you gave, you know, my brother the greatest deal in the world. I didn't get anything. But there are some really great things to do within a family to be able to help them, um, your son and your future daughter-in-law, that I think that the, the, that could be a really interesting idea, especially because you actually want to not be in this house long term. Well, I mean, I think you're in great shape. I Your general question was like, should I stop? Am I oversaving in my retirement? Yeah, you probably are. But, you know, I would prefer that a lot of your saving take place in the brokerage account. And then your strategy should be, I've got to get money out of that traditional environment yes. when my tax bracket drops down. And that will be, that will be, I think the generalized game plan, but you're not, look, I mean, at $200,000 plus the 60 from the rental property, you know, you're in a high tax bracket right now. So yeah. I wouldn't plus worry I get about, a pension. oh my God, the hits just keep coming from this woman. Unbelievable. What's the pension? It's a small pension about 14, a little over 14,000. Yeah, but that and your social security, you've got such low expenses, you're fine. Plus the rental income. I mean, plus, 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 plus. You're in great shape. You're a good saver. But I think that um, your your idea about, you know, am I oversaving in retirement? Absolutely. You don't need to. Flexibility in that brokerage account. And, you know, tax efficiency is going to be tough for you. Use your free cash flow. I would convert. I would pull money out. I'd look at a qualified charitable distribution. But again, you can only do that at age 70 and a half. So for five years, there are a lot of things that you can do to start to mitigate your future required minimum distributions. What's the total value of these rental properties? Approximately uh, two million. Oh, my God. They're not getting that, but how can you only get uh, 60 grand a year? Are you not charging enough rent? Maybe. Well, I don't know. I have a property manager. I'm pretty sure the rents are pretty good. And actually, I think it might be more like 85. I, I think I was wrong on that calculation. I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't really know that amount without pulling up the spreadsheet. Let's check on that, okay? <sighs> in such good shape. I can't even believe it, Mark. It's unbelievable. If you would like to join us on the program, all you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. The Jill on Money Show. We will be right back. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show. And if you're so shy that even changing your name and going on a syndicated radio show is too daunting, just go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, ask us your question because we do read emails on the air because we do want to make sure we take care of our shy folks out there. This note is from Ken who writes, 
I'm 72 this month and wondering what are your thoughts on starting to take my required minimum distribution now? I have five years left on a 10-year mortgage. The payment is $305 a month. I would use the RMD to pay this off sooner. If I'm going by the 4% rule, I would collect about $1,800 a year minus 10% for taxes. I've updated everything in my house, so not really expecting any major expenses in the near future. Right now, I'm living on Social Security with enough to live comfortably. Well, I mean, this is a real question about what other money you have available to you. Because when I look at this, Ken, I think, well, I can't imagine what the mortgage rate is, but if it's something that's maybe below 4%, I would hesitate to pay it off. So if you're in a tax bracket, if you're a single filer, uh, my guess is that I don't know if you've got this 10% for taxes. It, it would be more than that because everything you take out of your required minimum distribution would be money that counts towards your ordinary income. And uh, let's say you're single, maybe it's 12% because that bracket goes from about $11,600 for singles to $47,000. Um, that's the 12% bracket. But again, it may be smart to take the money out. I just don't know if paying down the mortgage is the smartest thing. So what I'd love to know is what else is going on in your life and then maybe we can help you out. Okay, that is the end of the hour, and we are always so happy that you stick with us right to the bitter end. Remember, if you've got a financial question, jillonmoney.com is your place. Click the Contact Us button and let us know if you would be willing to come on the air live because that's a lot of fun. Now, if you don't want to come on the air live, that's okay, too. We like to read your emails. We want to make sure we capture all the people out there who've got questions. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's the Jill on Money show. We are here answering your questions about your big life, and that little matter of how your finances play a role in helping you get where you want to go. And the most important part of this program is your participation, meaning we can only answer questions when you guys ask them. If something is going on, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button and let us know if you would be willing to come on the air live because that's a lot of fun. Now, if you don't want to come on the air live, that's okay too. We like to read your emails. We want to make sure we capture all the people out there who've got questions. If you are going to just write an email though, please give us lots of information so we can better answer the question that is in front of us. And once again, I just want to thank all of you for helping us become award winners. Yes, the All Women in Media Foundation, AWM Foundation, has notified us that we have been selected as a 2024 Gracie Award winner for the best nationally syndicated talk show. And you guys helped us do that. So thank you. And of course, thanks to executive producer Mark, who shares that honor with me because he is, as you know, the best executive producer in the whole world. So again, many thanks to all of you. Right now, let's answer an email from Mary, who writes, I am a gray divorce statistic after 36 years of marriage. Hmm. This is always weird to me. I am currently 62. As part of the settlement, I received 393 acres of farmland. The cropland rents out for approximately $48,000 a year. I just started taking Social Security, which is $863 a month. I only worked part-time off the farm, and my ex always espoused keeping income minimal, so the Social Security I receive off my own record is actually more than I would receive from half of his. 
always a little bit of a trap, I think, when people say, keep your income low because you don't want to pay taxes. Yeah, well, it impacts your Social Security benefit, so maybe not so much. Okay, Mary goes on to write, I have all of my estate documents. I have $60,000 in a high-yield savings account, $258,000 in laddered CDs. I own my own home, no mortgage, and it is valued at approximately $245,000. I pay off my credit cards each month. No other loans or debts. If I would sell my land, I would pay close to, oh my God, $900,000 in federal and state taxes because the value of the land is about $3.9 million. Oh my God, that is a big whopping tax that's due. All right. Mary goes on to say, my desire was to pass the land to my kids at my death so they would get the bump up in valuation with no tax, meaning that if Mary were to die, the land gets a step up in cost basis. It is tight living off the rent and then some interest. But at times I wonder if it makes more sense to sell the land now and then invest the money. I am a very conservative investor. What do you think is my best avenue? I hate the idea that at 62, you are feeling tight, especially when you have a $4 million asset. So let's just look at this. You sell the land at 3.9, you pay 900,000, you have $3 million, right? I have to believe that we're going to do better than $48,000 a year on your $3 million. I do. I think you could at least do twice that. So I am much more inclined for you to sell it, pay the tax and invest it. And if you need the money, great. And if you don't need the money, the kids will get the investments. And also, by the way, the tax situation today, tax rates are lower. We don't know where they're going to be in the future. So I know you'd like to help your kids, but I want to help you. It may seem awful to pay all that tax, but it may seem less awful when you think, well, I'll have $3 million that will spin off probably ninety dollars or $100,000 a year. So I hope that helps. And uh, do give us a holler if you need some more information. Okay, Kari says, you guys are the best. I'm hoping you can help me with the age-old Roth versus traditional 401k question. Kari does add, I may know where Mark stands on this. Kari is 43 and wife is going to be 50 this year, no kids. They have $420,000 combined. They've got retirement assets of $780,000, about 160 Roth, 480 pre-tax. There's an HSA of 23,000. There is a brokerage account of 20 grand. They're adding five or six grand a month. And there's cash of $100,000. We are both currently maxing out Roth 401ks, but we are considering a move. And this would be for me only from a Roth to a traditional 401k. Curious what you think of the idea. My wife would continue to max out the Roth 401k, including catch up. All right, now let's get into the why. The main reason I'm considering the move is so we can continue to build our brokerage account, which will serve as our bridge between when we decide to leave higher paying positions to moving to lower paying, less stressful jobs. The way I see it is that our money, especially my 401k, I'm six years younger than my wife, will have many years to grow before we begin to take distributions. So if the primary goal is to move to less stressful jobs and the money in the 401k has the time to grow, likely more than we need anyway, would our money best be used in the brokerage now rather than growing in the Roth 401k in order to accomplish the more pressing goal of moving part-time or less stressful? Or do I just continue to throw everything into the Roth, grow my brokerage at 60 to 70 grand a year? P.S. We totally realize how lucky we are to be contemplating the scenario. Also, just signed up for the Jill on Money live service. Mark, you deserve your bonus. (laughs) I like that. Well, I think in the hierarchy of what you are attempting to do, Uh, It does appear that building up that brokerage account could be really good. And I understand what you mean, that you would have free cash flow to do it. And by using a pre-tax 401k, that will give you more money to continue to fund the brokerage account. Of course, some of this is based on timing because you didn't mention when you would like to move to lower paying, less stressful jobs. So maybe if we're talking about 10 years from now, 
that that might be uh, more money than you need for your brokerage. If it's five years, we'd have to see. But you hear me talk to people all the time about this uh, off-ramp idea or a reset idea. And I think that the most important thing you can do is look at the numbers and see just how much money you will be making in the future. You know, eyeball it, guess, whatever, and then work backwards. Maybe you don't need six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars that's saved in a brokerage account. Maybe that, you know, you could have a few hundred thousand and that would be fine. And also maybe when the you know, you hit fifty nine and a half, one of the things that you could do is start taking money out of your wife's account at that time to help fund your cash flow needs. So there's a lot of different ways to get to the end game that you so desire. Happy to talk to you. And thank you so much for signing up for Jill on Money Live. If you have a question about something going on in your life and it touches your money in some way, don't hesitate. Get in touch with us. Go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and we'll get your note. Jill on Money, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's the Jill on Money show. We're answering your financial questions. Let's get to an email from Dev. My 64-year-old brother is decently employed. I don't know what that means, but that's a good line. But has a spouse who is unable to work, oh, due to a serious health condition. She has no assets of her own apart from my brother. He's also supporting his wife's elderly, low-income mother in a developing country. To provide him with relief and help him achieve retirement by age 70. I'm considering paying off his debts. He has $70,000 remaining on his mortgage at 4.75%. He's got $18,000 at 2% interest for a replacement furnace air conditioner unit. He will have Social Security and an inflation-adjusted state pension. Not sure of the amounts, but estimating a combined $90,000 to $100,000 per year at age 70, which is pretty close to what he's earning now. He currently has about $400,000 in a work retirement plan that he contributes to regularly and another $230,000 in non-retirement savings. So here's the question from Dev. Can I afford to pay off his debts or am I going too far? I'm aware of the IRS annual and lifetime gift limits and I know I would need to consult a tax advisor. Okay, here's Dev's details. I'm 65, single, recently retired. I have about $1.2 million in retirement savings, some Roth, but mostly pre-tax. I have another $740,000 in non-retirement brokerage, high-yield savings, I-bonds, CDs, money market accounts, treasuries, and checking accounts. My gosh. I have no debts. I need about $60,000 a year after tax to live on. At age 70, I will begin collecting Social Security estimated at $52,000 per year, and an inflation-adjusted lifetime pension of $93,000 per year. I can wait up until age 72 for a pension of about $121,000. I'm self-insuring for potential long-term care needs. Well, you got a boatload of money, Dev. I mean, I think that you could totally do this. But one thing to consider is the following, without having to get involved with lifetime gifts and all this limit stuff. First of all, You have to talk to your sibling and make sure that he is on board with this. I think the number one um, suggestion would be is that you don't have to do this all at once, right? He's 64. So what you could do is you could make a gift to him, either directly to him and or to his wife. So you could do both and you could stay within the gift tax limit. I think that if you were doing this all at once, it would, I don't know, feel a little bit strange to me. So let's talk about the, a a more uh, graduated strategy. 
Right now, you can gift up to $18,000 a year to any individual and not have to file any gift tax returns. So that means for you, you could do $18,000 to your brother, $18,000 to your sister-in-law, and they could then use that to pay down the mortgage. And then they could do that maybe over the next few years and the mortgage would be done. I think that might be a better way for you to manage it than trying to do it all at once. It'll make it easy for him to achieve his retirement by age 70. You can just be there and say, I'm just doing it. You know, it's like gifting to somebody and giving him a way to breathe a little bit and and maybe get himself set for retirement. So I hope that helps. This is from Julie, who writes, I heard about you from my mom, who is a big fan of the show, and I would appreciate your advice. I think I'm in good shape for someone just starting out, but I find investing intimidating and I'm not sure how I should be splitting up my money and planning for the near and distant future at the same time. I hope this isn't too basic for the program. There is nothing too basic for the program. Thank you, Julie. Here we go. Julie graduated with a bachelor's degree last May. No student debt. Academic scholarship for state university. Parents paid room and board and I worked all four years on campus for spending money. I love Julie. Yay, Julie. Julie earns $46,000, although she says, I'm already looking for a higher paying position. I contribute 8% to a 401k and the company matches up to 6% or I'm not sure they might match fully up to 6%. I'm not sure which way. She just said company pays in 6%. 401k balance, about $3,000 Roth 401k at Fidelity in a target date fund. Checking balance, $2,500, which is the average balance to pay my bills. I also have a high yield savings account, $27,000, general savings, emergency fund for six months of expenses. Side note, my grandparents put money aside since I was born. And instead of sending big presents for birthdays and holidays, they surprised me with a $17,000 gift after I graduated from college. Yes, I am grateful. I save the rest myself and I continue to transfer six to $800 each month after paying my bills. Hmm. Leftover 529 money, $13,500. My parents said we could move some of the money to start a Roth IRA for me and we're looking into that. I do not plan to go back to school for more education at this time. Okay, monthly expenses, $1,600 a month. That's great. Uh, I'm driving a 10-year-old car, no loan. It works fine. I plan to drive it as long as possible, but I probably need to put aside extra money for when I need to buy another car. I'm considering moving from our lower cost of living state to a higher cost of living state, maybe Boston or New York, for the experience and to expand job opportunities. I don't have any firm plans yet, but I may do so in one to two years. Or are you going to tell me to stay in a lower cost of living area? No, move to New York. We need as many people as possible. We'd love to have you. Come, 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 come. Okay, here are the questions. What general financial advice do you have for people just getting started career-wise? You're doing everything you should be doing. Absolutely, you're doing great. I think the only thing that I might look at is... You know, once you kind of, you're saving money for the car, which is great. And you should do that in the high yield savings account. But, you know, if you can afford to put six or $800, I might want to up my contribution level to the Roth 401k. That's the only thing that I would say that maybe you do 10% this year, see how that leaves your cash flow. And if you can do 10, 12, we'd love to get you up to say 15% in the Roth. That might be great. Um, And you should use the high yield savings account for the future car and a potential move. But I don't want to actually, I really want to be clear that I don't want you to put so much money into the 401k that you're not saving enough for this potential move, which could be pretty steep, you know. Um, Next question, should I put extra money into a brokerage account instead of the high yield savings account or increasing my contribution? So I'm going to say no to the brokerage, but Maybe put another 2% in the 401k and everything else in the high yield savings account, just in case, you know, you, you think like, oh, I'm missing out on the market. You're doing a little bit of both. You're putting money in the 401k. The target date fund will be fine for you. It's great. Okay, let's get to the 529 to the Roth IRA rules. First of all, the plan has to be open for more than 15 years. So you may not be there yet. I just want to be clear. You may not actually be able to do this yet. But let's pretend once it's 15 years, what you can do 
is you can put whatever the limit is at that time of a Roth IRA contribution from the 529 into a Roth. So, you know, if it were this year, then you would say, oh, okay, the plan's been open. Again, pretend that we have been open for 15 years. And you say, okay, I've got this old 529. I'm not going to use it for anything. And you could put $7,000. That's the maximum contribution that is allowable under the Roth IRA rules right now in from the 529 to the Roth. And you can do that every year until you soak up all the money and it is all in the Roth IRA. Because I'm not sure if your plan has been actually open for 15 years or not, we may be jumping the gun, but at least you have the information. And the last question is, does anything else come to mind when you consider my situation? No, you're kicking ass. You're doing great. Way to go, Julie. And uh, give us a holler if you want to come on and talk about things or anything big that's going on. Or you want us to sell you on the idea of moving to New York because Mark and I are very good salespeople when it comes to that. If you've got a financial question, we can help you out. Go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. Jill on Money Show will be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions. We are not the kind of folks who want to optimize your life. We want to try to help you find the way that is best for you. If you've got a question, just go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button, and we'll get your note. Right now, let's answer an email from Louisa, who says, I don't have cash to pay for the taxes for a Roth conversion. Is it wise to use money in a brokerage account to pay for the taxes to do the conversion? Thank you. Well, Louisa, it kind of depends. I know it's a little bit annoying of an answer, but hear me out. You didn't mention how much money is in that brokerage account. If there's tons and tons and tons of money and selling some of the assets within the portfolio is not going to change your life in any way. It's not going to change the the trajectory. Uh, maybe, but there could be a tax liability in doing it, which really does mean that you'd be selling something maybe at a time where you didn't want to realize a gain. I don't know. I really would have to know more about the specifics of other things going on in your life. So let me answer the question by saying, maybe. Gosh, poor Luis is like, thanks for nothing, Jill. This is from Anonymous, who writes, I've enjoyed listening to the pod for a long time. Back when Mark never talked and I pretended he was a potted fern with googly eyes on your desk that you consulted. (laughs) This is great. I have a question for 20 years from now. How would you bribe your kids to have grandchildren earlier? My husband and I, current parents of little kids, see our peers postpone or avoid parenthood due to finances. We've been spitballing on what would be the most effective tax-wise, psychologically advantageous way to get grandkids at 25 instead of 40 or never. Would you cover child care directly, cover housing, play with inheritance? Assuming retirement finances are in order, how would you bribe for grandchildren earlier? This is a hysterical question. Um, I would never get involved in this at all. This is such a personal question, and it depends on how your kids' lives are going to develop. There's many ways that you could support a an adult child to help them out having children, But let's cross that bridge when we come to it. I'm not sure why you're um, particularly focused on this issue right now, but it's kind of cute. Anita writes, my siblings and I inherited a duplex. We are planning to keep it, but only for the family, our kids. We don't want to be landlords to strangers. Is there an alternative to formally having them be quote unquote renters, which I presume would be considered taxable income on our part? We are in Western New York and also wondering about insurance on the property as it would not be owner occupied. 
Well, I mean, you don't have to charge them rent. So they could just live there and not be renters. And so if they want to just live there and maybe pay the utility bill or something like that, there's no real downside in that. And in terms of insurance, I think you'd have to talk to an insurance agent about that. I mean, it would not be owner occupied, but I wouldn't want to call it a rental property if you don't have rental income. So maybe you could just say, hey, it's my house. I'm not living there right now. It's a second residence. And if your kids live there, then the insurance company doesn't necessarily care about that. I don't think that's my two cents. Jessica writes that uh, my first car lease will soon end. It's about eight months from now. If I buy it out, I would owe $19,000 on it. Okay. Oh, boy. Here we go. This is a long this is a long um, train of thought on this. I will wait until about seven months just before the lease is up to refinance it with a federal bank. Since they have the best interest rates, I probably will be able to get not because of my credit score, but because of how interest rates are right now. After I refinance it to buy it out, I want to sell it to a dealership then get market value for it, plus the money to cover the loan. My current car is pretty basic for the model it is. I bought it during COVID. My options were limited. Should I sell it, then rebuy the same car in year with better bells and whistles that I can find for the buyout value of $19,000? I want to eventually pay this car off, but I also want it to be something worthy of keeping past the time when I can pay it off. Is this worth it? It does not sound like it's worth it at all, Jessica. This sounds like you're spinning your wheels for no particular reason. So what happens if you get a, a loan right now on the 19, that for the $19,000? What is, would the loan amount be, the interest rate? Also, number two, can you just buy something with a fewer bells and whistles and hang on to it? Can you be satisfied? If you're really just dying to get another car, it's going to cost you more money. And the bells and whistles will cost you money also. So I just think it might be worth you just hanging on to this or just saying done and go get another lease. So I need to know more about you. Maybe there are other ways that we can get that $19,000, but we need to know more about you and your life. Natalie writes, I have a question about the tax implications of canceling an overseas whole life insurance policy. I'm 31 years old. I was born overseas. My parents, who are still there and aren't particularly financially savvy, took out a whole life insurance policy on me shortly after I was born and have been paying its annual premium even to this day. When I turned 21, the plan owner switched from my parents to me. I told my parents I want to cancel it because it really doesn't make sense to have this and never did in the first place. They were fine with it. They generously told me I can keep whatever cash surrender value comes out of the policy. If I do keep the proceeds from the cancellation, about $30,000, will that be counted as ordinary income? I live in Illinois and my top bracket is 32%. Well, this is interesting. I don't know if it gets taxed in the country of domicile or here. And just because the proceeds are $30,000 does not mean that all of that is taxable. The way you would have to figure out the tax implications, you first would have to call the insurance company or contact them and find out what's the tax liability if I were to surrender the policy. And tax liability on insurance is kind of funky. It is basically, it is ordinary income, but it's above the amount of money your parents parents have already paid into the policy. So that's very important. I think that it's just interesting to me because I'm not sure about whether the country where the policy originated is the place that will levy the tax or in the United States. So we'll really have to um, get a little bit more information on that. And I will be happy to kind of work it through with you when you have that information. If you need some assistance with something going on in your life, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Yeah. 
you're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's get to an email from one of our favorite families. This is from Anonymous. The Anonymous folks, the Anonymous family, they are vast. They keep coming up. That family will fine. certainly qualify for financial aid. Yeah. <laughs> well, remember, uh, number of kids in school at the same time no longer matters for financial aid. Uh, okay. This is from Anonymous, whose subject is the trifecta. So it reads, hi, Jill and Mark, a couple of your recent podcasts hit on several issues that we are dealing with regarding my in-laws. They are in their late 80s and have resisted until very recently on getting their estate in order. This is that woman who's living in London who had that problem. It's terrible. Like, I don't know why parent people are so resistant. Okay. Anonymous goes on to say, while they have pension and social security income, my father-in-law has started and stopped several businesses, none of which have made any money. Oh my gosh. He's also quite addicted to options day trading to the point where he took out a reverse mortgage, which was on top of their existing mortgage to fund his trading. And they have no other savings. Oh God. This is a terrible story. With last year's rising interest rates, that did not go well. Their mortgage rate, oh, they must have had an adjustable rate, which approached 9%. They came to us for help. Oh, my God. They, request, they requested a gift of about $300,000 to pay off the mortgage. After talking to our advisor, we made it a loan, complete with mortgage paperwork. That's good. So that we are protected in case any future creditors try to claim the house. So far, they've been on time with their monthly payments to us. Father-in-law is a proponent of the, quote, die with zero, but we fear they'll have less than zero at this rate. We also worry about mo mother-in-law's future. She's a few years younger, doesn't stand up to her husband's financial foolishness. We will help them out again if needed, but it galls me that the father-in-law continues to use their money to play the market and not put anything aside for health care or other emergency spending. I don't know if there's anything else we can do to help them protect themselves. You could go. I wonder if they know where this account is traded. You could. Can you like report somebody and say, like, you should shut this dude off? That's not going to work. You um, know, unless they're somehow in charge of the account, they have a power of attorney. That's not going to work. Then, uh, I don't know. I feel like I don't know if there is anything you can do. Honest to God, I don't know if there's anything you can do. It's a terrible story. I'm I'm so I'm I'm so upset by this because it's like it is belligerent, it's foolhardy, it's selfish, but it is addictive behavior. So how, where's the money in that account? What we should have done is the, I think that maybe it should have been there was like a uh, you should have predicated any like I think I would have said any more help. Now we have the help that's any more help. We shut down the account and we have to see a zero balance and we take over your finances. That's what it has to happen. There has to be some sort of, we have to be able to create some safety for the mother-in-law. So if they want more help, uh, then that help comes at a cost. And the cost is we are going to make sure that you don't do this anymore. So if you want help, that's what it's going to be. Then wait till he dies and take care of your mother-in-law. So, so foolhardy. Oh, okay. Loretta wants to know about how to start an account. Um, oh, okay. Well, so Loretta's 62. She's still working full time. She said, I have $800 a month, Roth or brokerage. We need more information. We need more information. Like I, if you're still working, okay, and you have a pre-tax retirement account already, and it's a chunk of money that's in there, then potentially, yeah, we would have you do a Roth. But if you have not a lot of money outside of uh, retirement and you need an actual emergency reserve fund, then, yeah, maybe seed that. And a brokerage account would just be taxed based on the income generated and the capital gains when you sell something. But we need more information, Loretta. Sorry. Uh, OK. Oh, Gary writes, my daughter is 11. And I have a question about her credit. Should I create an account with one of the credit monitoring services and lock her down until she's 18? Yeah. You know what? I love this idea, Mark. Does Theo have a credit record or not? Theo's, uh, I froze his accounts. Okay. So this is what we, Mark, explain how that works. Because I think this is what everybody should do. Because there is identity theft of minors. It's weird, but it happens. So what did you do to freeze that account? 
Yeah, it's not as straightforward as if, you know, when you did it or when I did it. For us, it's very simple. But when uh, you're doing it for a minor, you actually have to prove that you are the minor's parent Mm -hmm. or guardian. So you have to submit, uh, I I forget what it was, but you had to submit some proof of of guardianship or parenthood. Uh, But that's it. It's just a few extra steps you got to jump through. But yeah, I would definitely do it. All right. So here's what we do. So we're going to, so set up the, set up some credit, Gary, freeze the credit. That's important. So no one else has access to it. And then you'll protect her. Oh, here's a nice one here. Also, this is from Jim, who is a beneficiary for two annuities um, that he inherited from his mother. One is $50,000. It has to be paid out in 10 years. The second is worth 65,000 must be paid out over five years. Considering the tax laws are changing in 26, would it be better to take the distributions completely in 24 and 25 or span it out over five and 10 year periods? Oh, one piece of information missing, Jim, is what is your tax bracket? Because I certainly would be interested in the second one getting paid out like that one. I might be interested in trying to get out in the next couple of years, but it depends what your tax bracket is. If you've got a question, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click the Contact Us button and we'll get your note. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we conclude the program, here is a note from Tiana. She writes, my husband of 35 years died a year and a half ago. Oh, gosh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Tiana goes on to say, I'm currently getting my house ready to put on the market. I brought this up when I had my taxes done this year, and the accountant said that I would need to get a special accountant for next year because he does not do taxes for estate sales. Do you have any advice on how to find somebody? Oh, that's so interesting because I guess that he may not be the type of person who files estate tax returns. I know it may sound a little bit nutty, but, you know, accountants all have different specialties and estate taxes are a subcategory. I think what might make sense is if you're working with an attorney on settling the estate or someone who helped prepare your will and those documents, I would go to that person and see if they have a referral. That's what I did. I was a co-executor on my friend's estate and we had a similar issue where the accountant who had done taxes for a while said, that we should get a tax preparer who specializes in estate taxes and resides in the same state as the deceased. So I hope that helps. I think that's the best idea because they usually know the people who you would normally contact. And for everybody listening, I know that these matters, these estate matters, they're so they're so heavy, very emotional. And if you need any assistance with that, we are here for you. And if you are dragging your heels on getting your estate taxes done, please come on, get it going, will you? It's a lot harder for people in the aftermath to deal with these situations if the documents have not been prepared. Okay, that is it. That is the program. All of our information lives on our website, jillonmoney.com. You should check that out. While you're there, just bookmark it. You'll come back. We refresh the blog section, the videos, all the different things that we produce every single week. Don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talerse was the best executive producer in the world and a darn good web king. Do something nice for someone else today. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.